Okay, let's talk about the uh, one by the sword. <sighs> Obviously, if you uh, if you watched any of the playthrough, this was somewhat frustrating in some ways, and also uh, a disappointment. <clears throat> but my expectations may have been too high. I guess my biggest complaint about it is actually that the scenarios all seem a little too much the same. You get a pile of scenarios in it, and, well, you know, I can't speak for the later ones with experience, but I can look at, because I only played two of them, I can look at the... Uh, at the special rules, and they just don't seem to be enough differences in the scenarios to make each one feel like something that I really want to experience on its own. Um, part of that's because the system is still fairly abstract, so it's not like uh, in a lot of in a lot of games you can be playing the same map with different circumstances and it feels very very different here it still would it would indeed feel very different but the goal of the game is almost always wander around pillaging and taking towns and cities and eh, it just gets kind of boring without a campaign overlay and a campaign overlay is not included and doesn't really lend itself uh, when you start looking at the game, you start thinking, well, how could I do a campaign to this? It's very easy with something like Frederick the Great to say, hmm, well, why didn't they add a campaign game to that? And, you know, you can very quickly come up with ways that you could put one together. And, in fact, somebody did early on. It's in one of the moves, but I don't have a copy of it. I should hunt it down if I'm ever going to play that. But in this case, because of the map and the fact that there's all these external uh, forces wandering onto the map and then maybe off again, I don't know, uh, but because this isn't the whole campaign uh, for the Thirty Years' War, you end up without an easy capability to put that campaign into, to put this game into you know, something that covers more than one year. <clears throat> so, you're looking at each individual year, and the forces are just kind of wandering around without too much in the way of a directed goal. Because in, in the war itself, there wasn't all that much of a directed goal. It really was, you know, try to keep my army alive, and try to take cities, and it doesn't really matter too much what those cities are. But, while historically believable, it ends up not being something that's, you know, uh, that each scenario is different enough to make me, at least, feel like, oh, I have to play it. Obviously, there was the whole fiasco with the original printing. Um, the new rules. They sure don't look like something that went through two extra years of development after it was released. Uh, it, I, unless this game ended up in some sort of, there's two things I can see. Either there were some real mistakes made even in the revision process, or this game just has some pathological problem to it that causes it to like. Uh, just continually spawn more vagueness, uh, more inconsistencies between the rules, the charts, the cards, <coughs> and uh, I just have no idea how, you know, something could have gotten so much flack for the original release, taken so long, and still not come out with something that's, you know, fairly well nailed down. I think one of 
the reasons might have been. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was going to say the sparseness of the rule book, but it's not the case. I mean, the cards should be aligned with the player aids. And, the, and there were not too many cases, but there were still a few where there were problems there. Uh, GMT definitely kind of went all out on the components. The map is the map. Um, but lots and lots of pieces. The deck of cards, nice shuffleable cards. Did you get damaged? But, you know, that's always the trade off. Do you want the iron plated cards of their deluxe versions that are dangerous to handle or something that might get a little nicked up? If you put sleeves on them, it doesn't matter what your choice is. So, uh, the rule book, other than other than the inconsistencies and and somewhat uh, less than complete, uh, and I'm not sure that's a bad thing. The, the rules are not, you know, nailed down as hard as in some GMT games. But honestly, I find it refreshing that it's only like 16 pages of rules. And I'm willing to put up with some of that. In fact, I wasn't too bothered by the inconsistencies even. Uh, eventually, you come to your own conclusions as to how to cope with things. But the paper that it's written on, and this is becoming so common is this damn, you know, the stuff that came out to make textbooks that were a thousand pages a little thinner and cheaper to produce. And the problem with it is that any dampness causes uh, damage to them. And so I have a little place where, you know, maybe there was a little moisture from the humidity or whatever where it stuck to my table. <laughs> just got torn by that. Uh, the map itself and the components are an interesting issue. So the map, I very much like the point-to-point -point representation here. I feel like it gives you the information you want correctly without looking too silly. Kind of reminds me, although it's a little bit bolder with the forts and such not, <coughs> of what you see in uh, Maria. Do I have Frederick? I thought I picked it up, but I'm not sure. Anyway, which is a game that I really should cover. However, when you're actually playing it, there's so much stuff on the map that it's causing problems. Um, so a given space might have a couple of a couple of the uh, columns on it, which are these big things on their stand-up markers which take up a lot of space on their own. But there aren't a lot of pieces on the board, there aren't a lot of these columns on the board, so it's okay uh, in terms of them. But then there's also, you know, possible garrisons in place, the desecration markers, desolation markers, I don't know what they're actually called. Um, but uh, the foraging... Uh, damage markers are on the board. You have individual uh, CAV units out on the board, uh, not even on the spaces, but on the connections between the spaces, just out there. And, and that's a clever idea of how to show things, except when you combine it with the clutter on the board, I ended up leaving them behind quite a bit. And that was a bit of a a regular occurrence where I was like, oh, where the hell were these supposed to be? <laughs> Too bad they weren't in the battle. Um, you can say, hey, that's okay. You know, it's not that big a deal within the game. Um, but it is a slight annoyance just in terms of the clutter on the board being, getting in the way of playing correctly, as it were. There's a lot of fiddling with the little uh, markers for 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 the uh, reduced uh, for, for 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 the foraging damage. A lot of fiddling with little uh, baggage point markers. 
a lot of mental fiddling with trying to keep tr the number of uh, steps in a large force somewhat accurate. Usually not such a big deal. <coughs> you, the number that you had is probably, you know, if, if your number strays, it's probably okay. But every now and then you're right close to one of the break points and that's where it becomes uh, more important you know, how accurate those breakpoints really are in terms of, gee, we, we have to worry about them terribly. Well, they have a big effect on play, maybe more than they should. I'd rather kind of, I, it, it would be impossible to do in, in, in any realistic way. But basically you have three sizes of units. A small unit that's like 25 points, including its baggage or less, uh, medium size, which is 50 or less, and large, which is bigger than 50. Well, there's a fairly large effect on the amount of baggage points and the amount of foraging you can get off of those different levels of size. So that's, uh, there's a big jump as to how, how the game, uh, you know, how, how a column operates, uh, the differences between it. And it feels like that should be more gradual. But, you know, three numbers or three different categories is a big enough... Um, it, 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 it's an, it takes up enough space on the card, it takes up enough mental space that it's kind of cool that there aren't more. It's just, hey, you know, whenever I see inconsistencies or things that'll... Well, things that bother me a little bit in the system that don't seem to align with reality perfectly. Um, I end up kind of griping about them, even if there's no solution. Uh, yeah, with the components, the, uh, the garrison markers, I have this stored in a really weird sort of way. The garrison markers aren't differentiated enough, so it's kind of difficult to tell, hey, what's the Swedish side and what's the Imperial side of the counter. Facing helped with that, but sometimes I wasn't sure. In addition, with the marker clutter, when you're putting the, uh, there's markers that indicate that a garrison has refused to surrender. Well, when you put that on top of the garrison, or really, it, it hides which type of garrison it is. So a better solution for that, uh, I can think of some. There's also this weird situation where there's restricted, there's counters that are limited by the counter mix on the back side of counters that aren't limited by the counter mix. And you just kind of sit there scratching your head saying, well, what does that all mean? Uh, my feeling is that probably the best solution is to use some kind of little tiddlywinks or something that you can see through so you can see what the garrison is underneath and uh, mark the refusing to surrender that way. That way you don't end up using up, you know, a limited resource that might be important elsewhere. But I didn't run into the problem of the tactics markers, tactical advantage markers, which are on the back side of that big problem. Another thing that's a big problem is these little chits for the leader capabilities. All they have is a number on them, and you're constantly looking up what that number is in here to help you decide what you're going to do in a turn. It would have been much, much better if they had put uh, a word on there. And the only reason I can think of for using a number like that is in case they wanted to support foreign language translation a little better. Well, I've played games that have the word in a language that I don't know well, like French, and it's easier than coping with the numbers. Even if I have to look up the counter all the time, then at least for people who understand the language the game was printed in, it's not the same burden. Uh, and that, that really kind of got in the way of my enjoyment. On the other hand, the core system of the game the use of the CDG style play with 
the the events being always available, even if you play the card for the uh, uh, operations points, as it were. I like that. I like that flavor. What you had with a hand of cards was basically a, a set of capabilities that your army has. So it felt very much like I was actually making reasonable decisions with my points. You know, do I stay here and spend time recruiting? That makes a lot more sense than, ah, do I move my army or am I going to rally, you know, be pumping more troops in? Which never made a lot of sense to me in, you know, the World War I uh, Paths of Glory and then everything that kind of followed after that, that has that. Some of the much more abstract games, like here I stand, hey, it's okay that everything kind of flows together. But here what I've got is really, you know, wow, I've got the ability to forage better. Um, I've got the knowledge of how much forage I'm going to need. And I have this event that maybe, you know, well, I also have the movement points. But I have this event that is very much under my control. I'm not calling weather gods here or anything like that. The only thing that I disagree with there is the the only card that kind of bothers me there is the poor forage cards. Uh, they didn't really work terribly well. Uh, I liked the focus on siege in the game in terms of, you know, this much more complex system where you have to build up points, you have to actually work your siege up by, by uh, building points. I thought that worked very nicely and very much represented the reality nicely. In fact, there's a lot of things in this that are designed to reflect reality. Um, the problem is there's these little hitches in them. So for example, the ability to refuse combat comes with a victory point penalty, but it is the same no matter what the size of the force. That kind of disturbs me. Throughout the playthrough, I found a lot of places where I didn't feel like the historical accuracy was matching what I'd expect from a Ben Hall game, especially where the game kind of drilled down a little too much. So for example, in the, ba in the battles, they end up not really feeling like they cover uh, the full options of what would happen in, um, you know, in the Musket and Pike series games. Uh, you clearly wanted to almost always overweight your wings, move, uh, move away from the center, but your center could just dissolve during the bombardment, and you're not even penalized for this. Except that you don't have a center, you don't have the strength points in the center when your wings come in and, you know, smash into it. But the wings basically get to fight twice, except for the infantry, which is one reason why you might want to keep your forces, you know, some forces in the center uh, more than your minimum. It didn't mean much for the attacker to reposition their forces because the defender gets to choose to position their forces second. So you have kind of a, uh, I might as well go balanced as the attacker all the time and the defender has to choose, hey, can I beat the attacker? Do I have reasonable odds of that? Or do I want to overweight one wing and see if I can win the battle with one wing? Yeah. It's okay. But one thing I definitely liked about the cards is that there aren't any stupid, uh, any any reaction type cards, which always are a pain in the butt for me, even if I'm playing opposed, but definitely when I'm playing solo. Uh, overall, I found the play more exciting than and, and more fun than I kind of expected. And for that reason, I have to say, I've got really kind of mixed views on the game. I, I, I feel like the play value I got out of it is the kind of play value I'd get out of a really cool magazine game, which is, yeah, I played it once, and now it'll, it'll go on the shelf and, and, and wait for a little bit. But with all those scenarios, I feel like I'm kind of getting cheated 
by not wanting to play them all. So that's kind of a downer. But for a, uh, you know, for pulling out a scenario once a year or a couple times a year, I think this is not a bad game at all. It's just not one where you want to play every single scenario one after the other because it ends up, you know, feeling like they're all the same. So if you compared it to, say, Maria, um, Maria gives you one scenario, and you've got about an equivalent game here in terms of the fun value. There's something very cool about about the way the the actual actions play out. Um, on the other hand, the little disputes about the historicity, well, on the overall, it gives you something that feels historically accurate from the big picture. It's just that when you look at certain things that are happening, you kind of say, well, why is that always happening that way? Or uh, that seems a little weird or whatever. And that, that can be kind of a gripe. So what I'd say with this is this is not terribly well received, partially because of the initial screw ups, probably in a large part because of the period. People liked the Musket and Pike. They were really excited about it, like me. But then didn't really uh, didn't really feel like they got the same kind of thing out of it or whatever. Didn't want to wait around for the uh, the release and the the release of the updated rules kit and such. It does have some intriguing little differences from any other game that you've seen. Uh, the way the card play works, where you play, you can have up to four columns in play. Two of them you kind of control in your hand, but two of them you're going to draw random stuff. All of that's really neat. So my, my advice is actually either try to pick up a used copy of it, because people seem to be dumping them at reasonably low prices or even better yet wait for it to hit the bargain bin because it's almost guaranteed to um, these games you know it might be a couple of years but these games that uh, that don't get an initial big reception end up just sitting there and very few of them you know get sort of a rebirth one game that got a re got that I was worried was going to get buried, uh, but there was nothing wrong with it the way there was with this as initial release, was um, Unconditional Surrender. But that sort of got overshadowed in the initial sort of hype. People were more interested in Supreme Commander for some reason, and obviously Unconditional Surrender has... Uh, really taken off since then and Supreme Commander has kind of it, it had a bad release as well but it kind of ended up as a flop um, but a lot of people were like betting on Supreme Commander rather than Unconditional Surrender <laughs> that was a mistake um, yeah so as to who this is going to appeal to that's an interesting question I mean obviously look you want to be interested in the period to have any any interest in this game, probably, and that's kind of a hard uh, a hard stretch. A lot of people are not that interested in the Thirty Years of War, but it's not a game that is going to really appeal very heavily to the competitive player. There's a lot of randomness in this. There's a lot of chaos in it, and on the other hand where it gets kind of the details wrong and stuff, that's stuff that's going to st stick in your craw. Uh, so for me, it's kind of a, it's almost a light game. Uh, it, it's something that I could see sitting down and playing just for shits and giggles more than anything else because things can be really swingy in it. Um, there can be... You're, you're, you're not like really focusing on that... Uh, now, I know exactly what happens if I do this. But on the other hand, you still have a lot of planning available with the cards. Anyway, I think 
it's a cool game uh, and one that you probably if, if you do have any interest in the subject probably do actually want to pick up even though you know some people have rated it not terribly well uh, just don't expect too much from it right <laughs> you know <laughs> <clears throat> don't expect that you're going to want to play every single scenario one after the other the way that I did feel about Kingdom of Heaven I got to the last couple of them when I was getting kind of tired of it uh, you want to you really want to look at this as you know I'll play one and then put it aside and play another one a little later um, as sort of the best way, way of looking at it because they are two the same. They are too similar to really, really make, at least me, want to play another one right afterwards. All right, let's send it up, and maybe we'll come back and play some of the others at some other point before we die.